Hebrews 13, verse 5. Say amen if you're there. Amen. Praise God. Um, just remember the spaghetti meals coming up. Let's get behind our young people. Amen. Are you ready? Let your conversation be without covetousness. That's tough in America. Want, want, want. And be content with such things as ye have. For he saith, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do unto me. <laughs> I'll be honest with you, that one's a tough one to put into practice because I got a roof over my head. I got food in the fridge, Brother Lawrence. I got a chest freezer. Oh, man. Got stuff. Got money in the bank. What do I need to trust God for right now? I'm upright. It's very easy to major in minors and miss. miss the very king of glory. I'm going to go to Matthew 28. I'm going to read verses 19 and 20. We need to pray and move forward. It's very easy to neglect the conduct of a disciple when you're consumed with the attributes and blessings of the world around you. If you have everything, it's really hard to go knock doors. If you're full, it'd be hard for you to set aside playing around to go reach the lost. Y'all in trouble, I wore my comfort shirt yesterday. Some of you, what's that? It says comfort's trying to kill you. You, you in trouble today. <laughs> <laughs> Are you ready? Go ye therefore. Sometimes. Teach all nations. Baptizing them in the name, singular, of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Jesus said, I've come in my Father's name. It was the Holy Ghost that overshadowed Mary. So the Holy Ghost is the Father. Well, Here, O Israel, the Lord our God is still one Lord, folks. Just understand, he can do what he wants when he wants to manifest himself as he wants to, even in a burning bush. There's still one God. No one's being baptized here. In fact, you won't find anybody baptized using a formula that they've tried to take from this in the titles in the Bible. You won't find it not there. It's good and important that we know the word. Now, I'm not really here to talk about that, but I'd be remiss if I didn't say it. So let's go to the next, next verse. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And here's where I wanted, wanted, wanted to get to. Because that's the life we're supposed to live. And lo, I am with you always. There you go, folks. Even unto the end of the world. Everybody say amen. amen. Come on, you said it. My life's over, man. Come on. Some of us have been down in some darkness. Oh, this is it. This is the one that's going to do me in. Ah. Sit there and the doctor says, oh, yeah. Some of us have 
been in the hospital room and heard the beep, beep of the mom. Yeah? You know how those people look at you when you're in that bed and they get that cadaverous look and you're sitting there going, I know what they're thinking, but nobody wants to say it. <laughs> I've been there. <laughs> I want to I want to talk to you about the unknown today. I want to talk to you about walking into the unknown. Let's put our Bibles down. And I'm thankful that he said he'll be with us even unto the end of the world. Amen. Lord, we ask you today to be with us. Walk with us and talk with us, Lord. Lord, I pray for a quickening in our spirit today that we can hear from your word, that there would be an understanding with each and every day that you could truly order our steps. And the same words that order blessings can order trials. The same word that can order miracles can order messes, Lord, that we would walk with you and talk with you and be in step with you, Lord, even in the unknown, even in the darkness, even in the struggle and the trial, God. We, we ask that our hand be in that nail-scarred hand securely today. And everybody say in Jesus' name. God bless you. You can be seated. <clears throat> Hallelujah. There is a story that is told of some old-time mariners, sailors, in an old ship in the middle of a stormy sea. The boat ship was being rocked to and fro, and this is back before the time of radio. There's no mayday. There's no alert system. The Coast Guard's not coming. The Navy's not looking. And so the crew is just beside themselves, afraid for their lives. The old ship is struggling against the storm and the waves, and they got to the point they didn't even know if they were going to make it or not. And so one of the young sailors in his, in his uh, fretting decided, I'm going to go talk to the captain and simply ask him if we're safe. And he makes his way to the cabin and goes in there and asks him, Captain, are we going to be okay? And the captain experienced weather-worn seamen. Well, I'll put it to you this way. The boilers on the ship are worn out in danger of overheating and exploding. They may fail at any moment. The ship is very old and we're taking on water and we have been for a while. So to be very honest with you, we may lose the boilers. They may even explode and we could possibly sink. Having said that, the captain narrowed his glare into the face of the young sailor with resolve in his eyes and said, we may go up <laughs> or we may go down, but either way, we're pressing on. <laughs> Paul stated in Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 through 16, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. What a beautiful place to be in the context that he's speaking. See, a lot of us think in, in America you've arrived, you've apprehended. But in the kingdom of God, <laughs> he, he gets a qualifying point here. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. At some point, you've got to mature enough that there are some things in this world and in this that you've got to put behind you because there's something more important before you that you haven't accomplished yet. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ right. Jesus. If you want to understand a preacher, 
If you want to understand the anointing, if you want to understand what it is that propels a human, a, a man or a woman to forsake the things of the world and turn their back, and though they have the sustenance in a house, and all, their main purpose are consumed with reaching out for God. You'll find it in the Old Testament. You Job blurted out, oh, that I knew where I might find him. He didn't ask for his stuff back. He didn't ask for his children back. He didn't want more money. He didn't ask for his help. Oh, that I knew where I might find him. There's some, I'm not talking about those playing. I'm talking about those really at the point of battle in their life, in the darkness, in the struggle, that I'm still trying to get a hold and apprehend this great God. He gets inclusive. The next thing that let us, therefore, no, I don't really like the next statement because I don't qualify, but I'm still trying. That's a part of the apprehending. He's perfect, I'm not. As many as be perfect. But now he's talking about the thus minded. Matters what you're thinking about matters what you're studying. It matters what you put yourself to learn. It's called discipline to be a disciple. It's not about having it or not having it. It's about knowing I got to apprehend this thing. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Be thus minded. And if any thing you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. You just kind of got to be willing to listen. He speaks, he tells you. Anybody ever heard him tell you in the middle of this is carnal and you've wasted a lot of time on it. Yeah, you prayed 10 minutes, but you did an obligatory and you could have got up and committed yourself to apprehending in prayer and you'd have walked away anointed. Years ago, I'll never forget it. <sighs> Labor pains like crazy, a lot of stuff going on, going to see the doctor. <sighs> Run in, do a quick sonogram and even before <sighs> gave us the full results, sent a nurse in and the doctor was gone. I was frustrated. I was like, I wanted to talk. I, this is serious to me. So I was kind of disgruntled a little bit, and I go get in the car, put my family in the car, and I go leave, and then I see, I see the doctor come out the side door with his golf clubs, and he went and shoved them in the back of his car. Young 20-year-old guy, y'all know me. I think I could have taken that nine iron and made him a necktie. <laughs> but how offensive is that? But how many of us do that to God? Oh, I'm called. I'm this and I'm that. But I got other things to do. I need you to hear this because we're going to get, we're going to have to walk through darkness, right? <sighs> Nevertheless, that struggle is there, but Paul's beautifully speaking. Nevertheless, weren't you, we have already attained. Let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. That's how we need to handle life today. This is a brand new time. This is a brand new spiritual awakening or sleeping going on in our world today. This is the first new year that's ever been like this. I can't and you can't predict what's happening next. We couldn't predict what we just went through. It took everybody. I said it myself, 2020, the year of clear vision. Uh, how'd that work for you? <laughs> Mask and COVID and shutdowns and yeah. Are you hearing what I'm saying? 
whatever happens in the next 12 months, one thing is settled. Many things will fall, falter, or even fail. But the church will still be victorious. <laughs> it's all a matter of what your focus is. Uh, if, you want, if you want to be victorious, get with the thing that's going to be victorious. Now, I, 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 I let the cat out of the bag. We know that the world is, well, we don't know. That's why we're pressing on. Jesus has already informed us that even the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. <laughs> I don't know what you want to be about. I don't know what you want to be involved in. I don't know what little side job or project or things that are consuming you, but I want to get involved in the thing that I know it don't matter what... The year 2021 brings, the church is going to be victorious. The church is still going to stand. The church will still. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm excited. But I, I don't know how, Brother Ulu, I don't know why I'm here. I'm not special. There's nothing great about me. He plucked me out of a ditch of life. I come from nothing and nowhere from a nobody. <laughs> but this one thing that I do, <laughs> I, got, I got the same distractions as anybody else. I just decided, like Paul, wait a minute, this one thing, uh, I'm going to try to get after what been, oh, Jesus, I've got to have more. All right, all right. Let, 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 me, let me calm this down before I run out of gas, before I get to the finish line. Ancient map makers, you know, long before GPS and Rand McNally, they would draw maps as they explored. And whenever they drew these maps and made these maps on the, the paper, whenever they had an area of the paper where they didn't know what was there, if you look at ancient maps, they would put crazy looking, almost LSD inspired creatures. You know, something out of Dr. Seuss they draw dragons and monsters and sea monsters and crazy looking scary things that who thought of that but they did that and I don't know if the map makers or cartographers were I don't know I think it was just their saying way of saying I don't know what's there <laughs> I don't know what's beyond this point I don't know I don't know what's in store for the rest of 2021. I don't know what's beyond what have I, I have experienced. It's that place, they put those in that place where I've not been there. I have no idea what's there. There may be monsters. There may be dragons. It may be darkness. The funny thing is, as had, did any of those map makers really see a monster or a dragon before? Didn't stop them from presuming. Look, because if there's something in darkness, it's got to be bad, right? <laughs> I'm 53 years old. Daylight, I walk around like I own the place. Nighttime, everybody walks a little slower. <laughs> Darkness does that to everybody. <laughs> Tripping could be a monster at my age, okay? <laughs> I fall and I might not be able to get back up. <laughs> Hallelujah. Are you hearing me? That's the way fear works. It always presumes the worst. Right? 
ignores the fact that, you know, none of them have seen a monster or a dragon anywhere. So, without reason, beyond evidence, to believe that there might be some monsters or dragons in the midst of the frightening unknown it's just kind of something we kind of do. You know, I was laughing the other day, and he's not in here. Aaron was coming out of the <laughs> fellowship hall. You got to love Aaron. He was so awesome. <laughs> and he's doing something, and uh, he was walking towards the church. And I acted like there was something in the darkness. Boy, he picked up his feet right in the church. <laughs> and he turned around, and you could see the. I'm okay. It just it was awesome. We are we some of us are still kids. We I don't know what's going on next week. <laughs> yeah. We can all look ahead to this year 2021. And I have to tell you with all that's going on that it is a sentiment that I understand it, you know, this ain't like every other new year where I'm jumping up and down with optimism and, yeah, I'm kind of, I don't know if I'm going to open that door. <laughs> you know, there's normally optimism and we're like excited and we're like, yeah, a brand new fresh year, a, a new beginning, a new start, but with everything that's going on politically and socially, you know, I'm kind of walking with like one eye open all the time. Who knows what this year is going to bring? Who knows what it's going to, I mean, who, who could have guessed what we must went through? So, so much has changed, and we saw things happen so fast that we never would have imagined. And those of us that know the Bible know, oh, this stuff's got to happen, but wow. <laughs> Even in just the last couple of days. There's never been a time like this. There's never been a, a place like this. The world has never faced more uncertain times than what we face right now. And so if 2021 was a map, <laughs> you might want be thinking of it as like, there's some scary monsters there. <laughs> if I, <laughs> I'm sorry, but maybe not you, but... There's, there's a giant flying, flame-breathing lizard over here, and there's this hairy, scary monster, bad breath and green teeth going to pop up. Right? We don't know. So much has happened that has put us on edge, but let's remember some facts that are forever settled. In fact, it's, it's awesome that, that three writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all quote Jesus exactly the same on this statement in Matthew uh, 24, 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. <laughs> Mark 13, 31. Heaven and earth. Yeah, this, this, this. <laughs> just outside the door. Shall pass away, but my word shall shall not pass away. Luke 21, 33, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. It kind of reminds me of what Jesus said to Peter. I, and I say also unto thee, unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The world may go, but the church is going to live. The church is going to win. The church is going to prevail. The church is going to exist. The church is going to win. God will have his church while the world passes away, while politics pass away, while all the junk and the trinkets that we think has so much value passes away. Way. The church will be saved. <laughs> Whatever this new year brings, there are simple truths that if we will hold fast, they'll sustain us. We put our confidence in his word. Are you hearing me? 
We've already learned we can't trust the politician's word. So through the unknown, through those uncertain times and those unnavigated yet places where we put monsters and dragons through whatever is ahead of us, the church, it will be victorious. So firstly, I want to break down our text for just a few moments. In verse 5, he uses a word. Let your conduct be without covetousness. It's all, if all you're all about is what you can get for you, you've missed it. Be content with such thing as you have. Well, maybe I'm all by myself on this one. If you think about it, Paul reiterates this in Philippians 1 and 27. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Is, is what you're doing and what you're talking about becometh of the gospel? Amen. Does it become you as a Christian? Does it become you as being Christ-like? That whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs? What are you known for? What are you about? What are you doing? What's your involvement with what? That you stand fast. Listen to this. In one spirit. With one mind. Striving together. Not with one another. Only the enemy wants that. For the faith of the gospel. Paul's talking about the church. Paul's talking about the mission. Paul's talking about the focus of the saints of God to continue how it started. What did he say? In one spirit and one mind, Acts chapter 2, verse 1, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. What was going on? That's how it started, and that's how it continues. You want to know where it goes if it misses from your life? Get your mind and your heart back in one accord with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Get back to doing the things of the church. Everything else will pass away, but the church is going to be victorious. The church is going to win. If you want to eliminate the fear of being lost, get back involved in working with saving people. Get back involved in the church. Put away the foolish, childish things and pick up the things of God. We live in a time of a restless spirit. We live in a time where people are constantly wanting to get. Amazon didn't get as big as it did because people didn't want something. Can you imagine if the church people had a prayer life like their Amazon orders? Mm-hmm. Oh, we had a coveting life of the things of God like we do for the things of this world. So that one of the first keys to facing this new year with everything that's going on is with hope instead of fear. How do we do that? Contentment. Find contentment. Simple Be content with such things as you have, right? Hey, married folk, you like it now? If you're content, you ain't looking. Have you ever really thought about it, what it means to be content? It means to be satisfied it is a, in the sense of fulfillment that brings peace and happiness into our unhappy people are uncontented people and I'm going to tell you something right now you can't appease a person like that because it comes from the inside not the outside in fact the Hebrew writer presents 
covetousness as the antithesis of contentment. You're restless. You've got to have this. You've got, because you're not content. Contentment is the opposite. It is about recognizing what you have. It's about being content with where you find yourself spiritually in the face of eternity. Why did he focus on the rich man building bigger barns? Why? It, there's nothing wrong in what he was doing in a financial scheme of things. But when your soul's on the line by how you conduct yourself, you're wanting more. You're not content and you're going after and you've neglected. The reason you get to the place, you want more, you want this, you want that, you want it. You got a hold of the greatest thing ever given to this planet in the plan of salvation and the walk with God. Can you imagine how ridiculous it's going to be to not make it because of things or stuff or attitudes or mentalities because you weren't content with the fact that you got the pearl of great price? It's about realizing how blessed I really am and how wonderful it is to be able to walk in the spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. I want, I want, I want. Paul, yea, doubtless, just prior, I, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. Has anybody exhausted and got the pinnacle of knowledge of God? And you want to spend all your time. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Wow. Why is it? I want to make sure I say this right. Let me let me find this. Radical obedience doesn't seek to comply to minimal standards, but pursues an extravagant fulfillment. Okay. Anybody know someone that's fanatical and radical about something? In fact, they're known for it. Their name is synonymous with it. You can't help. You say basketball, you think of one name. I don't care who's famous today. One name. Thank you. Different errors all saying, why? The dude was fanatical. He, was, he poured himself into it. We get that, to gain a worldly victory. But we know that's all going to fade away. All, ask yourself, no matter how young or how old you are, what's your focus? An extravagant fulfillment because you become satisfied where you're at with God. You haven't grown in a long time, but other things have. Right? We need radical disciples today because 2021, what you had in 2020 and 2019 and all the way, ain't going to cut it this year. We need radical believers. We need people, brother, Bruce at 61, still running, still excited, still wanting to preach because you're still trying to apprehend that for which is apprehend. You're not full of worldliness and a mindset that's been deceived. We need on fire preachers, on fire teachers, on fire singers, on, oh my God, hallelujah. We need committed Bibles teacher. We need committed saints of God. What about persistent intercessors? My God, I need a couple more Verdells in this church. I need a couple more Brother Bruce's in this church. Give me some more Corey worshipers.
just a little bit be seated. I'm, and I don't mean to be calling anybody out. Listen. I'll give you a sentence. You are never more like the devil than when you want glory for yourself. The moment you stop wanting the glory, fighting for your little ridiculous opinion, all that, and you'll find yourself at an altar weeping, wanting more of God. Oh, my God. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, we need to get back to the day we're walking in the hospital rooms and praying and people get healed. We need to get back to that place where we're walking on our campuses or on our jobs. People come to us for a word from God. I don't want to sermonize. I don't want to be preaching this sermon. Oh, that was cool how we did that. No, if it doesn't change you and it doesn't affect you and it doesn't cause you to pursue Christ more, I failed. I'm not just reading stuff out of a book. They are spirit and they are life and they can transform you and they can get you from this terra firma into heavenly places if you'll pursue it. Listen, and he, Paul goes on, that I may win Christ and be found in him, which involved in, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law. Oh, God. Jesus. Holiness without love is not God's holiness, and love without God's holiness is not God's love. Did you hear me? I don't care how hard you hold the standards you like. It's probably the ones you're not doing that God's looking for. Are you hearing me? But that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may, somebody, know him. What did Job say? That I may know where I might find him. He pulses that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. I am still trying to apprehend that for which I'm apprehended of. I've brushed up against the holy God. I've been touched by his presence and his spirit. I've taken on his name, but I don't have enough. I've read his word. I felt his power, but I haven't got enough yet. I'm not there yet. I'm not there. It's the things, the stuff. Of this world that makes a poor substitute. Are you hearing me? In America, the saddest thing is we're so poor, all we have is money. We've lost focus on what's really important. Jesus said, Matthew, Mark, Luke, they all record it. For what shall it profit a man if it shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Yet as apostolics, we disregard it because... I said it before, but here we go again. I'm going to say it online now. Some are ameristolic and not apostolic. That's right. That's right. Paul goes on, he says in Philippians 4, I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content. This is the NIV for the clarification for some that may struggle with the uh, these and the thousand begets and all the other stuff with the King James. I am not saying this because I am in need. I'm not asking you to give me nothing. For I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Paul goes on. 
to instruct the most susceptible to the allure of worldly gain. And he talks to Timothy and he gives Timothy an insight that I hope you grasp. Timothy was his protege. Timothy was walking through areas that Paul knew were gonna be scary. Men tripped up, young people tripped up, tripped up by worldliness. He said, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Well, I appreciate all the amen in that, but are you living that? We sacrifice our spirituality so that I can get some more of that green. We sacrifice being on fire so I can, we sacrifice a walk with God. Well, I'm not called to that. What? No, 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 no. You've misplaced what you should be apprehending. Listen to this. He goes on. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. He's talking to Timothy. But, and that's another big but, they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. I get it. We got to pay the bills. We, we live in America. There's a certain standard that we want to be seen to have. I get it. I'm as susceptible as the next guy. I get it. It's our battle. If we lived in another world, it would be poverty we'd be battling. I've seen it. I've preached, I've gone on missions, I've preached overseas. I watched, I've, I've seen the cardboard uh, complexes that they build and, and watched a guy take a bath in a mud puddle. Some of you have seen those things and yet we come back here and we get comfortable and we stop reaching for an amazing walk with God. Oh, I got God's approval. I'm blessed. Not realize that maybe Satan made sure you had that to keep you from getting anointed. He didn't stop with temptation and a snare. Anybody ever seen what a snare does? I have found traps and snares with body parts in them. I found I was hunting one time and I went down into the ditch and I just something caught my look down there and there was a trap that had a little leg bone in it. They lock you down to a spot to where you have to stop pulling against it because it's... And so to save the leg, you lose it. Where are you going with this, Pastor? It's better to enter into heaven maimed. It's better... Oh, God, oh, man, 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 man. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I don't want to cause you to. I, I, I get it. I, man, I want you to jump and shout and be excited about living for God. But in all honesty, let's make sure we're living for God. It's so easy for that enemy in our flesh to trick us to living for ourselves. It's so easy to want the glory and not realize I become like my father, the devil. And oh my God, I've missed it all this time. And snare, and listen, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts. Listen, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root. Money's not evil, but it's the root. If every time you turn around, that's your reference, that's your reference, that's your reference. Which while some coveted, there's that word coveted, the opposite of contentment after they, listen, this is an important word, they have erred from the faith. You can come to church and err from the faith. You can own the Bible and err from the faith. In fact, Jesus said, there's people that come, I've done many wonderful things, I never knew you. They erred from the faith somewhere. And listen to this, and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. But I like this. Are you ready for this? But thou, I like it all. 
Oh, men of God, the people of God, flee. Flee these things. Flee. Paul's telling Timothy, listen here, young man, all this is going to go on. All this is going to entice you. All this stuff is going to want to get you and, and, and just consume you and take it for time and take it for time. And you're going to become, men are going to pat you on the back and people are going to think you're awesome because if you get all this stuff, he said, listen, son, flee. Run. You can't handle it. You will not balance it. You can't do it. Jesus even said you can't serve both. He said God and Mama. He said it. Flee and follow after righteousness and godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Well, wait a minute. That don't make me look too good because I can't park it in the driveway. I can't pull up and let my neighbors look. Look what I got. That whole meekness thing, Lord. I can't put it on the mantle. <laughs> Timothy, it's not about trophies here, my friend. That's not about trophies. We're in the... We're in a fight. So he says, after meekness, meekness is not weakness. Amen. Humility is invincible. Yes, yes. Pride is always going to be resisted. But listen, he said the word meekness, and the next word is fight. See, I'm not fighting you. That's, it. That's what the enemy wants. Because right. if you're fighting one another, you fight the preaching. You don't like it because it. If, you know where my fight is? Flee it. Stop coveting it. Get content with the things of God. Fight the good fight of faith, he said. The fight is for faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many Witnesses, godly contentment is what gives fullness to life. Uh, no, you won't put it on the mantle, but you'll feel it in your soul. With the pers pervasive spirit of greed in America, it's so easy to become consumed with wanting. We just came through Christmas so much so that even church folks that are not careful will lose the side of what we do have. Bless you. Assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Mm -mm -mm especially in times like we face today where everything is turned upside down. There's shutdown and sickness and struggles and people fighting and anger and hatred and division and family feuds and, and addictions and COVID mandates, mass mandates. You're taking everything from us. <laughs> if you don't value it, you won't miss nothing because you still got God. Why is this happening? God, what did I ever do to deserve that my, my family is at war at home? Why am I going through this? I, I'm not finding any comfort. Why does my life have to be like this? Listen to me. Discontentment is a disease. Covetousness is the symptom. It eats you from the inside out. It's never satisfied. It's never happy with what it has, and so it takes your joy. Listen, entertainment is the thief of joy. You're living for that moment of an endorphin dump. You're living for, wow, look what I got, or that little moment. Some people are settling for just that endorphin dump from a like on your Facebook post. I hate to break it to you, but one of the best things the enemy's doing Shut down your media. Go ahead. 
shut down Facebook, shut down Twitter, shut it down. Maybe we should start focusing on the people around us right in the room. Maybe we should start get back to focusing on the task at hand for the church. Maybe you need to quit living for the people that are a million miles away and start living for the church right around us. My neighbors, my families, my friends. Stop being covetous for the world and start being the church, being a witness, being the light in your own home, setting an example in the church. You have to understand this, 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 the thief of this world, the things of this world takes your peace. It robs you of understanding and it steals your right thinking. Listen to what the Bible says. James speaks. He talks about good gifts come from your heavenly father. He said, then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. See that stuff that you think is so important? It's not a gift. It's a snare. It's a tripping point. The accolades, all the stuff you put on your wall. I, I, I get it. We, 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 it's hard to be content with such things that we have when there's so much more to get. Every good gift and every perfect gift, just so you know where it's at. James 1, 5 and 15 and 17. And every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the, let us say, Father of lights. Fathers are important. And don't I know. With whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. That shadow is a haze that blocks. The light has been blocked. Oh, those things the things America, it's opulence, the world and all, all that stuff blocks the light. And instead of walking in the light, we're walking in shadow. God is the greatest life coach, guidance counselor, financial advisor, life insurance provider, banker, doctor, lawyer, and judge known to man. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Oh, that you'd let him govern your life. Oh, he knows what he's doing. He knows the end from the beginning. He is the author and the finisher of the beginning and the end. Church, let me tell you something. No matter what last year has done to us, no matter what your past has done to you, no matter what's lurking in the darkness, we have security in the fact that we belong to him and he belongs to us. There's a certain peace that comes from understanding that through it all, I can trust him. If you've been through it all, can you say amen? If you've been, if you've been to that place in your life where you really wondered if you could make it into the next minute and you realize, hey, I'm still here. You better believe it. He's mine and I'm here. I'm still here, devil. I'm still here, world. I'm still trying to apprehend. I'm still trying to get more. I want more. Do it all I can trust him. Do it all I can rely on him. Do it all I can find my peace in him. Do it all I find my joy in him. Do it all I can believe in him. Do it all I can depend on God. I get it, I get it, hold on. There may be some parts on our life map, some unknowns. There may be dragons and monsters and scary things, dark valleys to walk through. 
dark valleys to them. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear. There may be tumultuous tomorrows. There may be problems and struggles. But whatever happens to me, I am content to know I am his and he is mine. You want to know where I find contentment? Oh, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me that I am his own. Oh, and the joy we share as we tarry there. Oh, no other has ever known. There ain't nothing like riding with Jesus, walking with Jesus, living with Jesus. by birth I may live in America but it doesn't own me and America doesn't have the final say I've been born again I belong oh, ah, I've been born to be in heavenly places America doesn't have the final say my Jesus does Listen, 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 listen. Let me, let me, let me, I got to get involved all of a sudden. I got to hurry up. Man, I got to hurry up. Y'all make me preach too long and stuff. Thank you. Let me try. Hey, if we can, if we can stay out talking until 11.15 after meeting at 8, I'm actually not taking that long. And I, <laughs> listen, Philippians 4.10. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Listen, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased. See, in America today, if you go without, there's, you think something's wrong. We don't know how to say no to do something for God. See, let, let me talk about money. When we pass the offering plate, here, plate, here's our mindset. How little can I give and still be right with God? Instead of how great can I give that I could please God? Come on, we, 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 we take it down. Be honest. See, a lot of times, um, let me tell you something. I heard a preacher say this to a whole group of preachers. Your money is going to be your problem. You stack it up like cordwood, and you turn around and you think God gave it to you. Don't we? Yeah. We ask for callings. We ask for anointings. We ask for this. But for us? Let me put it to you this way. I've seen it. She just walked out. But those of you that can sing real good, better believe the temptation to go sing for the world will be there. Yeah. I've watched it. I, I, I have a guy that I knew for years, one of the best soul winners, greatest preachers, messed up. You know what he's doing now? He's a worldly life coach for people. Mass, he's not leading them to salvation, but under the cloak of his abilities, God blessed him. The, the gifts and talents are, are without repentance. He still has it. But instead of leading people to God, he has to, he's leading them astray. It happens. America's all willing, the spirit of this age is all willing to get you diverted from your calling, to get you diverted. So he's talking to him. I have learned in whatsoever state I am to be content. I know how to be a base and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I've learned both to be full and be hungry, both to abound and suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Let me ask you this. When's the last time you were doing something that demanded strength from God that you had to ask him for it? Well, someone said every day, but I'm going to be honest with you. That's commitment. Don't confuse commitment with calling. All are called, few are chosen. You've got to say, wait a minute. What am I really called to do? And have I fulfilled that? Paul was in prison when he wrote what I just read to you. Paul was in prison when he wrote that. He said, I've learned in whatsoever state I'm in to be content. Let me share spiritual truth with you right here. <coughs> if you can 
be content in times like these, you're never going to be content, no matter how good things could be. Because contentment is not a product of your circumstance. Contentment is an expression of your faith in Jesus Christ. So from a prison cell, Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What are you talking about? What? You're locked down in a prison. You're surrounded by darkness. You're surrounded by the unknown. We learn contentment is not about the absence of dragons or monsters. It's not about the absence of darkness. Contentment is about the presence of faith. That key to making it through troubled times and storms and whatever 2021 might bring down your... The cop may be at your house by Friday. The doctor may call. Darkness may show up and there may be dragons and monsters, but we simply have to learn to be content in the Lord. Paul, the New Testament. Listen to this. Paul, if you haven't read the New Testament... If you haven't studied Paul, he's the firebrand of faith, the basket rider, the storm surfer, the snake charmer, the heathen helper, the whipping whipper, the survivor, preacher, demon destroyer, mentor. Gives us some trial surviving advice. Be careful for nothing, but in, it, in everything with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your heart and your mind through Jesus Christ. Faithful folks don't lose their mind. Faithful folks don't lose heart. Faithful folks don't quit. Faithful folks don't get exasperated and frustrated and want to throw in the towel because we're trusting God. We're not shaken because our desires are the things of God and not the things of this world. And that's just Paul. We got Job's life, David's life, Peter's life, Esther's life, Rahab's life. And I can go on and on. They had faith that even though there were dragons and monsters and darkness and problems, they focused on God. Listen, you don't have to have all the answers. That's where preachers mess up. Get over yourself. You think we can really understand all there is of God? Do we really want to get to the point and think, well, I got this thing sewed up? And why do we live like we do? How can anybody with the Holy Ghost that's lived in this world go week after week without coming to an altar? How do you not find yourself on your face before God a couple of times a week? I got to get my head right. I got to get my mind right. I, I, haven't, I, haven't, I haven't felt the Holy Ghost. I haven't been inspired. I haven't spoken tongues. I haven't witnessed. I haven't, I, well, oh, oh, I got to get back to apprehending that for which I've been. Oh. Can I, can, I'm going to say something here. God, does, God doesn't owe us an explanation. He does simply ask you to trust him. Because if he didn't, it wouldn't be faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Some of us have really damaged and dumbed ourselves down spiritually. Don't get so focused on frustrated desires. Brethren, Paul's imploring us the Philippians, listen, brethren. I don't. I can't imagine what it'd been like to be in the audience. Paul, you, you make us all look. Look at your, you, you sat at the feet of Gamaliel. You did all these amazing things. What do you mean you haven't? You've got everything. But he says, I count not my. Okay, let me help you. Stop counting. Stop counting. He who dies with the most toys probably still dies. Bill Gates, Elon Musk, man, awesome. But he who dies with the most money, it really don't mean jack. 
I know here it does. It doesn't matter how many movies you start in. <laughs> yeah. Well, gee, that's Tom Cruise. I got to let him into heaven. God's not impressed. <laughs> He's more concerned about us acting right than acting out. <laughs> you hearing me? I count not myself, but this one thing I do, this one thing. Everybody say one thing. Forgetting those things which are behind. There are some things in your life that you need to get behind you. There are some things behind that you are making them important. You're making them prominent. Your whole life's about them. Everything you talk about is about them. You got to get them behind you and reach forth under those things. Yeah, you ain't got enough of God yet. I press, I press, I press. There may be monsters in the dark, but I press for the prize of the high calling. God in Paul was content with simple things in life because his focus was pursuing a closer walk with God. Nothing will safeguard you through uncertain times like the power of contentment that comes from your identity in Jesus. Fight it every day. You fight it every day. You have to keep up with the Joneses. You got to keep up with the neighbor. You got to keep up appearances. You know what? No. I want to keep up with apprehensions. I'm still trying to get hold of you, Jesus, more. Stop. Think about this. Paul had just been shipwrecked. God spoke to him. If y'all stay in the boat, you're all going to make it. If y'all stay in the boat, you're all going to make it. They listened to Paul. They all stayed with the boat and they all made it. Now they're on a island there, it's cold, they're wet not like they could run down to the Motel 6 or whatever and get a room and turn the heat on there was no truck stop to go get a shower, no gym to go get it. so what are they doing they're gathering sticks to make a fire surely the great amazing trial and proving ground of the shipwreck was enough for Paul see that's the problem with some of us, we get a little success and we want to stop there and we never really get to be a witness or a light to the people right in our vicinity. And here's Paul in front of all those people that are still talking about the miraculous thing. That Paul picks up some wood to put in the fire. Church, it is about the fire. Is the fire still burning in your life? Are you still concerned about the Holy Ghost and fire? He goes to put that wood in the fire. He puts that in there and a viper comes out. You know, he didn't just bite them because, you know, people, people, this is people. I don't know. Did he really get bit? So instead of just getting bit, that thing latched on. It's kind of like a Brother Bruce story. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're not just going to fall. Your teeth got to come out your lip or something like that, you know. <laughs> you steal a car, you throw tomatoes, whatever. So Brother brought Brother. Paul and Brother Bruce, they got this. Here he is. He got the snake is hanging on his hand. Now listen, I'm sorry. I'd be sissified and crispy right then. I'd be screaming like a girl. Get it off me. <laughs> Whatever. He shook it off in the fire. It's hard to shake it off in a fire you ain't got. You're stuck. Because you need to get your fire built. You're stuck. Quit chasing out the things of this world and get on fire for God. And the next time the enemy tries to lie, shake it off in the fire. Shake it off. Listen, I got to hurry up because I got enough for tonight. Jesus Christ, as cliche as it sounds, you have all you will ever really need. One of the greatest moments in any believer's life is when they finally find out that Jesus is all you really need. And why do you have so much stuff of this world? You've got to get confidence in his promise. Another key to surviving the darkness and the map of your life is confidence in his promise. 
why are we so busy trying to get the things of this world when we've been promised heaven? We don't believe the promise. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Remember that's what he said Luke, in, in Hebrews? Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I don't know what you're going to face this year. I don't know what's going to happen, even tomorrow. But there's one thing we know. I know he'll never leave me. I know he'll never leave me. Though the mountain be shaken and cast it, it don't matter. I know he won't forsake me. Isn't that wonderful? That's a promise. That's worth more than all the tea in China. In him I have all that I really need. He's promised me. He's promised you. He'll never leave me nor forsake me. This is probably one of the most encouraging, important verses of scripture in all of the Bible. I don't have to be afraid of what tomorrow might bring. I don't have to worry about what I don't know. I don't have to be concerned about what's lurking in the darkness because I know I won't face it alone. You're not facing it by yourself. You're not going through it alone. He hasn't abandoned you. Adversity is not abandonment. I don't know what's coming in the next 12 months. I don't know. But not to blow it off, but to be honest, it doesn't really matter because there's one thing I do know. There's one thing that I know for sure that wherever I am, he's with me. Whatever I go through, I'm not by myself. Whatever's hidden in that darkness, whatever comes around the corner, I will not face it by myself. I will not go through it alone. The economy may well collapse. And every penny you got mean nothing. They may shut everything down. it alone skirmishes may uprise around the country civil war may break out and I still won't face that by myself listen to Isaiah fear thou not for I am with thee be not dismayed for I am thy God I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Behold, all they that were incensed against thee shall be ashamed and confounded. They shall be as nothing. They that strive with thee shall perish. Thou shalt seek them and not find them, even them that contend with thee. They that war against thee shall be as nothing as a, and as a thing of naught. For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, fear not. Is anybody looking for him today? If he's going to hold you by your right hand, what would happen if we just started extending it? it. Oh, what would happen if we get back to that? I don't care or know what will happen. The stock market may crash. Health system may crash. Gas prices may skyrocket. But I'll not face any of it alone. Psychologists have always said that this time of year, is the worst time of year for people who are alone. It is considered the most loneliest time of year. If you've lost loved ones or for some reason or another, because of COVID and restrictions, you couldn't be with family for the holidays. They say there are intense feelings around the world of people being alone, literally causes suicides, and depression. understand it. In fact, this year myself, I've never spent Christmas without the access or ability to spend it with my mom until this year. It was different. Thank you for your text. A lot of stuff has happened that I never thought was possible. For there to be a time for separations and divisions to be caused by anything other than the grave, I, I just never conceived what we've gone through. 
but believe it or not, folks, we face that this year. There are a lot of people around us and out there right now who still feel alone and cut off from everyone and everything. You can be surrounded by people in your home and feel alone, but let me tell you something. I can give you a promise right out of his word. I can tell you right now, you may feel that way, but he himself said, I will never leave you and I'll never forsake you. Did you get it? He said it. He said never. He said never. And I've had people say never. But there ain't nothing like when God says never. <laughs> because we've already understood that even COVID could blow up a never. <laughs> but his never is, listen, non-negotiable. Nothing will be able to separate you from the love of God. This promise is even more forceful in the Greek because a little something gets lost in the translation. The Greek literally uses four negatives compounded together in two pairs to express the certainty of God's promise here. If you were to translate it into literal English from its, from its origin, it might better say, I will never ever leave you and I will never ever forsake you. It's got the two double negatives in there. It's never ever, never ever, ever say never ever. Now, one commentator said about this repetition of negatives, the aim is to remove all objections that fear and unbelief may give rise to. That thing, that darkness, that dragon, that monster, ain't enough to stop a God's never ever. It ain't enough to stop his loyalty and determination that I will never ever leave you now, never ever forsake you. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. That's my Jesus. God is saying whatever happens, you can count on two things. I'm going to be there with you and I'm going to take care of you. Monsters, dragons, darkness, I don't know. I don't care. I've already got his promise. He's going to take care of me. He was born in the 1800s. His name was Alexander McLaren. He became a preacher. He's a Scottish origin pastor in Manchester, England. When he was about 16 years old, he got his first job. It was a job in the city, and so he had to make the journey there and Unlike today, there weren't the roads and the lights and the flashlights and the LEDs and the maps and all the wonderful stain things. So the family didn't have him a horse for him to ride to town. It was about eight miles from the homestead to the city. He would have to walk in on Monday and stay out throughout the week. That first week when he was getting ready to walk to the city, his dad came and said, Alex, when Friday comes, we want you to come home. This is the first time you've been away at home, and we want you to, as soon as you get off work on Friday, to come home. It's all well and good, but there was an issue. Because between the city and his home, there was this deep ravine or valley. They didn't have city going out there to weed, eat, and dig and make sure the path was clear. They just didn't have that stuff there. It was dark. It was foreboding in those days. And Alex was 16. There were robbers, thieves, and worse that was hiding there. In fact, it wasn't too long before some had actually been killed there. But down deep in that ravine, Alex was concerned. He knew that coming from the city, he would have to go through the dark ravine at night. That changes everything, folks. So he said to his dad, you know, I'll be tired after working all week. Why don't I just spend the night in the city and come home Saturday? And his dad said, no, your mom and I want you to come home Friday night. So he worked that week, and that Friday night, he got off. Every step brought him closer and closer 
to that ravine. He tried not to think about it, but it stayed right at the forefront of his mind. And the closer he got, the more different kind of images of scary things he created in the map of his mind. He arrived at the edge of the ravine and he's looking into the darkness. His mind is creating all sorts of scenarios of what could be next. Staring down into the dark valley, paralyzed with fear. He didn't want to go down there. He didn't want to go into that valley alone. And he's standing there looking at it in fear. He heard something. And rustling in bushes and trees, he heard something. Something was down there moving toward him. He's frozen with fear. He couldn't move. He didn't know what was going to happen next. And then suddenly out of the dark. This form started coming towards him. He's on the brink of absolute terror. And in a split second, he recognized the form and realized that it was his dad coming up out of the ravine. His dad said, son, I thought that we might walk home together from here. Years later, the old preacher said, you'll never know the difference that made when my dad was there by my side. Yea, though I walked through the valley. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. I'm not going to fear the world because I know who walked. I'm not going to fear the darkness because I know who talks with me. I know a little bit about walking alone. I know what it feels like. I learned from the young age of how scary it is to have your dad ripped from your life and walk through this world in darkness. And I didn't have someone to go to how to do this and how, how to grow up to be a man and how to act. And I didn't have that and I faced a lot. Maybe not as well as Alex. There may be monsters. Dragons. But I can tell you we're not walking alone. Amen. I found it true that he'll never leave you and he'll never forsake you. People will turn on you. People, but no. He'll walk with you, and I find comfort in his presence. Let's stand. In verse 6, which is the comfort of his presence, is the voice of the confidence that is learned, so we may boldly say. I, I, I remember going through some things and some people that they were wonderful to me. They were mentors. They were everything. Talking about, well, he's probably done for now. You're, you're probably not, you know, just all that. But I can tell you that Paul was on to something. So, and I hope you live to get to this point. You may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? In fact, I love the way the Hebrew writer said it. We may boldly say. See, Paul was not just making a personal promise he experienced. Paul wasn't alone. He said, we I can call him my helper. You can call him your helper. He's our helper. He's the ever-present help in time of trouble. Paul said, we may, but I don't know what you're going through, but you can say the Lord is my helper. That's exactly what Alexander McLaren was explaining 
with that story when his dad walked with him through that dark, lonely valley. It's like my heavenly father by my side. I've got nothing to fear. My helper's with me. I will not fear. What consolation. That final phrase in verse 6 is intriguing to me as I close. It is drawn from the words of the psalmist who after taking comfort in the presence of the Lord asked in Psalms 56 and 11 and Psalms 118 and 6 What can man do unto me? Its purpose is to draw a contrast. Listen to me. Get this, if anything, today between what can man do and what God will do. Think about it. What can man do? Compared to what God will do. This is the source of confidence. What can any enemy do compared to what my God will do? Let me take it a step further. What can this year do to you? Compared to what God can do. What can hell do compared to what God is willing to do for those who will walk with him? I don't really know about all those old cartographers. I don't know about those dragons lurking in the darkness and monsters in unknown places, but I really believe it was their way of stating an exaggerated sense of absolute uncertainty that faced them in uncertain territories. There is uncertainty. But not with God. Monsters and dragons were extreme. They were the sum of every bad thing that could happen. I mean, what are typhoons? <laughs> Compared to fire-breathing dragons? What are hostile natives? Compared to scaled beasts. Dragons were used because they were epitome of all the bad things that could happen. That is with confidence today that I ask you this morning, what can they do? What can they do compared to the one who said, I will never ever leave you and never 